get started. Um, first two speakers are Michael Barton and Joe Smith. Both are senior software developers in the investigations and reporting team at The Guardian. For nearly two years, The Guardian has embedded a small team of software engineers in the newsroom, working daily with journalists. Um, and so we all hear tonight how this collaboration has been has been going, how it started, um, how it's been, um, how they've been working together. Um, so a, a very much an Hacksackers um, talk. And so now um, over to Michael and Joe um, to take us through. Thank you. Thanks, Federico. Uh, let me just share my screen so you can all see the slides. Can people see those? Cool. Uh, I can see them, but I'm talking with you. <laughs> I'm going to yes. see them. Uh, just the deafening silence of a massive call. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Joe. I, as Federico said, I'm a senior software en on engineer on the investigations and reporting team at The Guardian. I'm here with Michael. Uh, yeah, I'm also a senior developer on the team with Joe. Uh, and the other member of the team is uh, Amy Hughes, who's the manager. Um, so who are we? Um, I think you've gone on mute, Joe. That's strange. Uh, am I unmuted again now? Yeah, you can hear you now. Uh, okay. Not sure how that happened, but um, so we're a relatively new team. Um, we've been around for about a year and a half, uh, and until fairly recently, we've been known as Digital Investigation. So you may hear references to that team name as well. Our remit is to apply technology to the problem of helping journalists uncover stories. Uh, and we sit within the product and engineering department, uh, which is pretty big, about 100 engineers, and it has teams providing all sorts of um, things to like public facing products like the Guardian website, the Guardian app, read your revenue sites, but also internal tools um, like the tools used by journalists to write articles, manage production, um, and OFAN, our analytics platform, to see how journalism is performing online. So very much the, the, the sort of tech department. Um, but our team occupies quite a unique position within that department uh, because it's actually the first to focus exclusively on the news gathering and investigation part of the journalistic process. A former colleague of ours uh, used to say that uh, software teams at The Guardian start when they finish, i.e we uh, the tools and technology that we apply to journalism happen once the story is basically there already but that's changed with the formation of our team um, uh, there are two main strands to our work the first is building tools that journalists use directly and have broad applicability across stories and projects uh, and the second is collaborating with journalists on specific stories or projects using our technical skills to get them information that might otherwise be difficult or impossible. And these two strands do feed into each other uh, in interesting and important ways. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the tools, uh, a bit in more depth about uh, some specific journalistic projects, and then we'll end with some reflections on what's made the team successful so far and, and where we might go next. So with that, I will hand over to Michael. Yeah, um, so I'll kind of just give a quick overview about the origins of the team. Um, so uh, we started off uh, about four years ago now, working out of the editorial tools department. So as Joe mentioned, that's the team who look after our internal CMS composer. Um, and we were originally working on a tool called Giant. Uh, so I think there's a screenshot on the next slide. Um, but Giant is the Guardian's in-house platform for uh, searching and analyzing data leaks and data dumps. Uh, so, you know, someone comes in with a terabyte hard drive full of PDFs, emails, goodness only knows what, uh, and Giant's a piece of software that can scrape all the stuff off the, uh, off the drive 
uh, make it searchable and indexable. Uh, we started on that about four years ago, um, but it's got a lot in common with systems like Aleph from the OCCRP and DataShare from the ICIJ. Giant is, is very much in that vein. Um, and it's been used on several projects uh, quite successfully, but within editorial tools, its use was, was somewhat sporadic. Uh, I think data leaks are probably rarer than all of us would like uh, working in this industry. Um, but certainly it was uh, sometimes hard to justify the work on uh, tools like Giant um, against, you know, mission critical publishing systems like Composer. Um, and actually Giant since uh, has found an interesting niche uh, within a folder of COVID procurement related contracts and stage publications. There's even all of the transcripts of those interminable press conferences, if anybody really wants to go back through them. Um, and Joe will talk a little bit later on about how Giant's kind of been helpful there. But um, what we learned from Giant was just there was so much opportunity uh, for building a suite of tools for news gathering and for that kind of pre publication building up the story. Um, and Google, well, even Google Sheets sometimes um, to bring all this stuff together. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about how this has worked out um, in the context of a couple of projects. Um, so to start with, I think I'll go over the Queen's Consent project that we uh, recently published. So to set the scene for this one, um, David Pegg and Rob Evans, two of The Guardian's finest investigative journalists, were submerged deep in the National Archives, uh, trying to dig up information on a pretty arcane piece of parliamentary procedure known as Queen's Consent. So quite to the surprise of them, and certainly to us, um, the convention in the UK is that uh, bills that could affect the interests of the sovereign or of the royal family um, are sent to uh, the Queen's lawyers, essentially for review beforehand, through a process known as Queen's Consent. And the evidence of this process happening is that within Hansard, that sort of original bastion of, of open data, the record of what everyone said in Parliament uh, for a long, long time, um, there's phrases like Queen's consent signified or Prince of Wales consent signified. And that's how you know that uh, a bill has been through this particular process. Um, so David and Rob had found plenty of evidence in the archive, um, but they came to us um, to ask, how many times have this happened? Could we use sort of our often this process had been used. Um, so the Hansard website, uh, shout out to it, it's amazing. It's got a search box, you search in the search box and it just works. Fabulous piece of government website engineering. Um, but you type in these phrases and it gets a bit more complicated for some of them, like have multiple phrases and you need to kind of combine them. Um, and overall, we got about four and a half thousand results spread across 150 pages, 30 results each. And, you know, going through that manually um, is already starting to look pretty intimidating. So uh, uh, we reached for that perfect tool in, I think, a lot of our kind of news nerd arsenal um, of web scraping. Uh, and in particular, we use webscraper.io. So that screenshot that we've got there uh, is the Hansard website. And then you can see the little browser extension for web scraper. And it's got some configuration for like which bits of the page to pull out. Um, I'm not going to go too much into web scraper other than just to say, as developers, we were very much familiar with writing our own code and scripts, maybe using Puppet to download the contents of a web page or scrape that way. Um, but we learned about Web Scraper from Pamela Duncan, one of the data journalists here at The Guardian. Um, and this was a fantastic opportunity for us to use a tool that data journalists were often using so that we understand you know, what it's capable of and maybe how we could extend it. Um, so in this case, the bills go through multiple readings. So you'll get like duplicate information when you, you do the scrape. And so you need to do a bit of deduplication, a little bit of analysis. And so for that, um, we used Athena uh, and we were writing SQL queries. So on the next slide, um, I'm sure you'll all be thrilled to see so that you never thought you'd see the queen with some SQL, but uh, here it is. Um, and there were some big queries uh, that we were running. And I guess what Athena brings us, which is really great, is we don't have to run the back end for databases and fill them up, which is not necessarily that complicated, but all we need to do is write a schema, upload the files to S3, and then just keep on writing these queries. It was designed for use with kind of big data, um, but it's been really useful for us just for kind of these medium to small size projects, just to minimize kind of the, the I guess, DevOps overhead, because being a small team, that, that's something that we try not to take too much on where, where we can. Um, so, you know, we run our queries, we did our spot checks, came up with the headline figure, 
of 1062 bills. And also, you know, the code is in GitHub, it's peer reviewed within the team. Um, and we got a front page byline out of it, which was a pretty big moment uh, for the team um, and really kind of vindicated uh, the work that we put into the project. But the key at this point was that we were in at the start of this project, we were in pretty early and we were constantly talking with David and Rob about the data we were producing, what they needed to find out from it, the answers they needed to get. And then we were refining our analysis, updating our queries and, and doing that. So we automated the boring stuff, but we were also there early enough uh, to be able to iterate with them um, as they progress through the story as well. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Joe now, who's going to give you another example of a journalism um, based project that we were working on, uh, which was COVID contracting. Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, so going a little bit backwards in time now, um, this is a story, series of stories, really, that developed over the course of 2020, um, even into the beginning of 2021, and was very much tied up with um, the pandemic and the change that that had in the news agenda and in society um, at large. Um, so back in May, it, it, it began when back in May last year, we were asked for help with a story about COVID related government procurement. Um, the Guardian wanted to investigate the use of emergency legislation to award contracts without competitive tender, um, citing the pandemic as an excuse. And uh, this contract data is public. Uh, it's available through at least two sources, an EU service uh, called Tenders Electronic Daily, aka TED. Um, and a gov.uk service called Contracts Finder. Um, sadly, of the EU service is no, long, no longer of relevance to UK news since the, the 1st of January this year, because we don't publish there anymore. Uh, but there is actually a replacement UK service. Um, so the data is there, but the way that the websites presented information would have meant huge amounts of manual work. Uh, to do simple things, for journalists to do simple things like add up the contract values or, or filter the contracts to those that have been awarded without tender. Um, so there's a similarity there with the Queen's consent um, story in that the information is there in some form, but uh, the journalists would have to do huge amounts of manual work to, to get the information they need. So we thought we could help and we wrote scripts that took data from the APIs and turned them into CSVs, which we loaded into Google Sheets uh, so that journalists could filter by the type of procedure used to award them, honing in on those that were direct awards, uh, as well as sort them and some by company. And the end result was a top 10 of the biggest winners from the state's largest under duress. This list is from last May. Uh, the list would look quite different now, although I think at least one of those companies is still in there. Um, the story didn't end there, mainly because uh, the UK government just kept on awarding contracts without tender to companies with political connections or with dubious prior expertise in the field. Um, and so we decided to invest a bit more in our TED scraper. Um, so we set it up to run every day looking for COVID related contracts writing a daily digest of um, the new, the day's new contracts directly into a Google Sheet. So using the Google Sheets API that you can see here. Um, and this turned out to be really useful for generating leads. For instance, when Randox was awarded a second big contract, we spotted it straight away and a journalist wrote up the story. Our scripts were also useful for turning leads into stories by verifying the background information and then fleshing it out with further relevant contextual data. Journalists would often get in touch with us asking for us to run custom searches, providing them with a Google Sheet where they could browse contracts of interest. And one example of this was a story about uh, uh, Uniserve. Uh, uh, which is quite interesting because of the way it sort of brings together different tools of ours. Um, we got involved when Guardian Investigative Journalists wanted to look for contracts where Uniserve was mentioned as the courier to confirm reports that they received that, that Uniserve had been given responsibility for a significant proportion of PPE freight. 
So for this one, we use the Contracts Finder scraper because Contracts Finder actually provides full contract documents. Um, and we downloaded all the PPE contracts uh, since the start of the pandemic. But then we, we wanted to search them and these were un, unstructured data. These are just documents. Some of them even, you know, just contain scanned pages. So no machine readable text. Uh, so quite different from, from scraping an API uh, that has structured data. So here, uh, Giant was the perfect tool. So we, we put these uh, files into Giant. Giant was able to do optical character recognition on them and turn them into searchable text. And we could search for Uniserve and confirm that, yes, many of the contracts awarded to other companies did actually mention Uniserve as a courier. Um, so at that point, uh, the next step was to go to the, to the structure, back to the structured data and use the TED scraper to get a list of all contracts since the start of the pandemic um, that were PP related um, and uh, just sum them by company, basically. Uh, and amazingly, um, Unisov topped the list, which ultimately um, led to the headline. Um, so what can we say about these two projects? Um, I mean, they're, they're different in some superficial ways, but actually they do, uh, I think their similarities point to some future tooling opportunities. Um, when we look at all of our projects in the round, the general shape of the problem has been quite similar. You start with some public data, uh, Hansard, Contracts Finder, TED, in other projects has been the uh, Facebook ad library API. Then you put the data into a tool where we can easily ask the questions that we want to ask. And this tool has variously been um, Athena, Kibana, which we haven't actually talked about here, but it's very good when uh, for searching um, as opposed to sort of aggregating. Um, and also, of course, Google Sheets. Um, but at the same time, each public data source does have its own quirks and specific characteristics uh, that require a fresh investment and time for each project. But I think that eliminating some of the mechanical aspects, the, the aspects that are similar across these projects, uh, would allow a more efficient focus on the things that make each project unique. And that, that could um, potentially be a big area of opportunity for tooling that we build in the future. So uh, on that note, I will hand back over to Michael. Yeah, I think just to follow up on, on what was Joe was saying, I think that pattern of, um, you know, working to get the headline figure from that data, the data to support reporting, I think is probably a pattern that will be familiar to, to a lot of you here today. Um, and we've also had the opportunity, you know, to learn from some of the best at, at The Guardian, from Keelan and the data projects team here, um, and from our investigative team on, on how to, you know, approach those stories. Um, but we've also come at it from the software engineering angle um, and sort of what, where we've had the opportunity to start building longer term tooling and, and also invest in that tooling. And so we, Joe and I were earlier on were thinking about kind of what's, um, you know, made us kind of successful so far and what kind of environment are we trying to set up to, to keep on uh, keep on going with this kind of balance. and. We, we get a lot of insight from helping on these deadline driven editorial projects and it's massively motivating for us and it's important so that we understand the process and understand what people need um, but the fact that we are a team within the guardian's project and engineering department provides a very good counterweight almost to that kind of news headline driven life cycle because uh, in our team we're not a desk uh, in the traditional editorial sense. Um, and that's actually a really positive thing because we can support uh, those editorial desks whilst taking potentially a longer term view and starting to build tooling as Joe was hinting at, um, which we can do because we have the support from our product engineering department and from our kind of more senior stakeholders to push back on the short term work when we need to invest in that longer term work. Um, it was hard for us to, when we started off as a team to know what tooling that we needed to build. But pitching in and working on these projects, um, we now know a lot more about how, you know, tools that would automate, say, looking at things in Companies House and the land registry would work. So now I think the team will probably shift more to working on those um, longer term tooling because that has impact 
um, across the newsroom. Um, and we also like, it's important to kind of highlight the evolution of the Guardian's digital department as an important precursor to what we've been able to do here. Because we've sort of just blown past and almost taken for granted all of our work being cloud-based. Um, we've got an Amazon account, we run our own services. Uh, we can OCR 10,000 documents and that's fine. We've got the budget to do it. Um, and in common with a lot of the teams at The Guardian, like the developers own and maintain and run their code. Um, like, of course, subject to, you know, imperfections and challenges. Like we try not to be a service department um, that's driven by specifications that are produced by, by others. But as developers, you know, we're wearing several hats at the same time, thinking broadly about the problems and getting involved to mold um, those specifications and mold what we're building as we go along. Um, and I guess the final point of kind of advice, if you could call it that, which is terrible advice during a pandemic, so I apologize for giving it in advance, is sitting together in the newsroom. Um, when we got started as a team, we were sat with Keelan's team, sat with the investigations team, and that allowed us to build up natural channels of communication and just, you know, friendliness that has then allowed us to keep this collaboration going through the pandemic. Um, and as with the Hansard project with David and Rob, a seat at the table while the projects are being planned and discussed is important, even if it's virtual. So we'll, you know, try to attend weekly meetings and not get involved in setting the agenda of, of those projects necessarily, but just so that we can provide that really valuable insight into how technology can help and where we can focus our energies to, to maximum impact. So that hopefully gives you kind of an overview of what the team's been up to for the last year and a half, a couple of projects that we've been working on, and maybe some advice on, you know, some of the kind of conditions that have led to, to us, um, you know, hopefully doing well so far and doing well in the future. Uh, and with that, I think we, we'd love to take your questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, we already have a couple of questions in the chat and if, any, if anyone else wants to ask something, do post in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, what would the team's advice be for doing these kinds of investigations in countries where government don't have as much data transparency? Uh, I, I guess I can have a go, Joan. Do you want to jump in Like, if I, if I miss anything? Um, I, I'm not sure we've got concrete advice from what we've been doing at the moment because so much of our reporting has benefited from, you know, the open data, like the, the land registry data coming off the back of private eyes, freedom of information requests to build it up in the first place. Um, what we do know is that there's still a lot of unexplored territory in tooling for structuring data. Um, so it's still, you know, um, not even necessarily within journalism, but across many fields. It's still a kind of open problem of you've got scans of thousands of documents and you want to extract out the names of people who are mentioned in this documents or maybe which company is owned by which other company um, and the basic building blocks are there like the AI models are trained and they're really good but they're not accessible in a way that you can sort of use them without like hacking together a python script or, or something like that um, and I know like some of our colleagues, like, like Sam Cutler has looked at building tools for helping with that structuring process, like showing you the things that aren't matching your extracting data. So say you're trying to match out someone's name and then you can't find the name in this document. So, you know, it's on a different part of the page or something, but there's definitely some areas that you could use to build tooling to help with that, which would help when you had limited data or data that wasn't already structured. Um, in terms of like campaigning for more data transparency, I think that that's definitely something that, that, that is kind of a much wider question, but there's still a lot of kind of low hanging fruit there for building tooling that can help, um, you know, not necessarily technically minded journalists, but journalists to start structuring of uh, unstructured documents, I guess. Um, Joe, you want to add something? Just going to very briefly add, this is far easier said than done. I never personally um, had to do this, but um, there have been, you know, major success stories of um, journalists writing about the current um, kind of state of, of play using whatever techniques they have at their disposal to get what little information there is. And then that becoming a story such that it puts pressure on government agencies to to open more up and one example here that is kind of the reason why the land registry for instance publishes all of its um 
corporate ownership information is because of private eyes um, efforts when they did a load of freedom of information requests and then published a data journalism story about that um, and then the land registry um, opened up so I think there are ways to kind of find anything that you can get you get your hands on and potentially turn that into a story that then puts pressure um, on official sources to open up um, more. Um, we have a question from um, Philip Nye, apologies if I mispronounce your surname, uh, a data scientist at the Institute for Government, um, who says, given the government contract website don't make the data especially accessible, did the Guardian consider making a front end that would allow the public to look through the data they gathered as they did with the MPs uh, expenses data? Hmm. Um, yeah, we've considered, I mean, the thing is uh, on the contract stuff, we only got as far as, we didn't even build a UI for the journalists really. We, we glued together, we wrote scripts that glued together the data to a really flexible universal data UI, AKA Google Sheets. Um, so we, we were kind of looking in a way for initially for quick wins, and then it turned into a longer term project. Um, and we were kind of leveraging stuff that was there already. Um, and we, and so yeah, opening that then to the public at large was, was probably even further down the road. Um, but it's an interesting thought because one area where we might be more likely to get to that kind of point is with um, land registry and companies house data, because we're currently, we've invested quite a bit in um, other tools that where developers are kind of in the middle, um, like BigQuery or Kibana, um, that, that at least let us search these massive um, data sets that contain all the corporate uh, land ownership data or contain like all the person of significant control um, data from companies house. But it's it's been so popular that we're now it seems it's it's a clear cut priority for us to build a UI that journalists can use. And I think and we would very soon like to be coding that in the open. We probably. <laughs> um, and at that point, I think the question of like, how do you make it useful to the to the general public is kind of someone else is going to use it, then then you don't want to kind of just just tailor it to your own needs. So it's it's a really interesting it's a really interesting question. I I don't know whether other there's other other examples of other news organisations or others that have put things. Uh, in place in between government sources of data. Open corporates springs to mind. So on the Hansard project, um, David and Rob were extremely keen to publish um, the full database of all of the bills that we'd scraped along with annotations from them about maybe interesting things about that bill to, to spark a debate essentially. Um, and to try and get other people involved. And so that in that case, it's just an embed with like a table um but what's really exciting about that is that um you know that sort of uh immediately in the minds of the journalists uh, rather than something that the developers are pushing for and that gives us even more reason then to to build that tooling um and we also made our scripts and stuff available for the hansard stuff so um i forgot to shout out our engineering blog uh these are screenshots from the guardian's digital engineering blog and there's four posts that go into a bit more detail about uh, what we've talked about today and on the queen's consent one you can see the sequel and stuff we've run which is nowhere near a front end that anyone can use but i think is an important kind of first step that developing in the open to then um as joe said start on the journey towards something that anybody could use um with a mother question that says um does your team dig data without a leading story um, and how often a story is born by just digging data as opposed to using data to support a story already in process. So, so maybe that's sort of like aspect of collaboration on story um, creation. Do you want to say that one, Michael? Yeah, I mean, so, so we'll do it a bit um, just in the kind of natural process of like, especially when we were still more in that exploratory phase of working out what projects we could be useful on and, and how we could help. Um, 
you know, when you when you're able to collaborate with really fantastic data journalists like we have here at the Guardian, um, then you learn a lot about like um, working out what data is out there and, you know, maybe searching for stories in it. And I wouldn't say that we're, you know, um, in that territory because they're already doing kind of fantastic work on that. Um, so then the question for us is more, how can we make that faster and how can we accelerate that process and that digging so that more people can do it? Um, because as we've sort of covered in a lot of what we've said today, um, there's still quite a lot of faff and Python scripts and all kinds of stuff, which you have to do to get through some of these open data sets and might be done kind of repetitively. So um, it's probably gonna be the team doing less digging but building more things to let more people dig, if you, if you see what I mean. Yeah, some stuff just really quickly, some stuff just like springs off the page though, like land registry. The first thing we did was like group by like count who had the most land titles and rank people or um, count who had the, the greatest like price, total price paid and that kind of stuff. Lots of, lots of, um, you know, journalists are immediately, interested in it it's not necessarily a story in and of itself but it kind of forms the basis for potential lines of inquiry um if i do it very quickly i can sneak in two more questions and merge two of the three that are there um one is what tools do you find most useful for automating the updating live data sets so that automatically updating the corporate land registry every time there is a new release and how far is natural language processing playing a role um, in your products? Uh, shall I take the, the take this one, Joe? Um, yeah. So uh, for automating the updating of live data sets, we do it really manually. Um, so we write out scripts and then automate them as containers in Amazon. Uh, and it's quite a heavyweight process. Um, the, to be honest, we're probably almost slightly over-engineering, so I'm not sure I'd encourage anybody to, to copy it necessarily. I think we've got a lot to learn about how we could do more generic tooling um, around that. Um, and certainly, like, if you think about, say, Jupyter Notebooks, for example, there's a lot of potential there for making them more live so that people could use it. But yeah, sorry, that's quite a nebulous answer, and we do it quite an old-fashioned way. Um, and on NLP... Um, I mean, at, at the moment, beyond using off the shelf NLP models to like extract names or extract phone numbers and that kind of stuff, we've, we've not done a huge amount on it because there's been a lot of low hanging fruit in the UK, just joining across existing pretty well structured open data sets. Um, but when you move into more kind of semi structured things like MPs interest data is one that often comes up. Um, then, you know, NLP and even potentially training ML models, I think is going to come, come more into play uh, for what we're doing. Very last one. You must be very popular in the newsroom, um, says John Duffy from the BBC News Online. Given you, are not in the given you are not in the editorial structure, how do you prioritize the assignments you work on or are they prioritized by a senior editor? Um, they're not prioritized by a senior editor, uh, uh, at least in, they may be beforehand in terms of if, if they get filtered via an editor, if the request comes from an editor, then presumably they've made a call about which one to forward on to us. But, but we do get um, requests um, directly from journalists. We haven't fully, we've only occasionally reached the point where the volume of requests was such that we couldn't respond in at least some way to to something even if it was just a cursory we've had a look at this data and it's really hard or we've had a look at this data and it's really feasible but you know it'll take us a week um so there's often we on a case-by-case -case basis a conversation about well what are the deadlines like is this a long-term project is it like you want to publish tomorrow um and we're prob right now i would say we're probably saying yes to slightly too much stuff and as we there will we're close to a point where we we will need to start being more ruthless or um expand the team and and just to kind of jump in on like the priorities there as well um that's where we're in probably one of the luckiest positions we could be because we have the support of 
product and engineering and also of um you know like say some of the more senior editorial people we work with um to at the moment make some of those calls ourselves um and that's precisely why kind of us as a team fits in really well with everyone else who is working on a more kind of editorial life cycle um because we're lucky enough to be given the the confidence oh sorry for people to have the confidence in us to to make those calls providing we you know we're delivering on the long-term tooling um, 